Dinosaurs, dinosaurs, dinosaurs. We all love to see dinosaurs. Leisurely walking through ancient forests, spitting venomous goo at Dennis Nedry, and certainly breaking free of their electrified enclosures to terrify panicked park goers. But before dinosaurs could be brought to the big screen, first, the filmmakers had to know where dinosaurs came from. So on this episode, we are going to take you on a journey through time that began 250 million years ago. Over the last quarter century, the beloved films in the Jurassic franchise have influenced and inspired a countless number of dinosaur fanatics to become paleontologists. And while we would all love to find and excavate a dinosaur, there's a great deal of knowledge that must be learned before one can venture out into the field and search for prehistoric treasure. Today, the Jurassic World Explorers and I are visiting the renowned Chicago Field Museum. As you approach the museum's Stanley Field Hall, you immediately notice that this is the home of Maximo, a full skeletal cast of the biggest titanosaur that scientists have discovered to date. Now in its 125th year, the Field Museum maintains one of the world's largest collections of artifacts and specimens. Yet this location is more than just impressive displays. Their scientists take part in groundbreaking research all over the world as they drive a mission to explore, protect, and celebrate nature and culture. For an even more in-depth education, the team and I will be getting the unique opportunity to go behind the scenes and into the Field Museum's vertebrate paleontology collections. Dinosaur and oversized collections. Sounds like we're in the right place. Our goal is to take you on a journey through the Mesozoic era, known as the Age of Reptiles, which spanned from 252 to 66 million years ago and consisted of three main periods, the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. I will be getting a hands-on education by working alongside two of the museum's finest dinosaur experts. Brandon Peacock, who specializes in the evolution of vertebrates from the Triassic period, and Bill Simpson, the head of geological collections and organizer of the museum's extensive fossil vertebrate collection. We begin in the Triassic, where Brandon will guide us along the way. Now this looks like one terrifying little creature from the Triassic. What kind of dinosaur is this, Brandon? So this animal's name is Acelisaurus Kongwei, and I gotta burst your bubble, it's not a dinosaur. This is not a dinosaur. This is not a dinosaur. I'm off to a rough start here so far today, guys. Okay, so when I back up a second and I look at this thing, it really looks to me like the Procomp Sognathus that uh -huh. was featured in Jurassic Park, The Lost World. You know, the little green ones that came out yeah. at the beginning yeah. and then attacked that guy in the forest. But you're telling me this is not a dinosaur. This is not a dinosaur. This animal is as close to being a dinosaur as you could possibly be, but just sort of technically, it's not a dinosaur. Is it technically a reptile? It is a reptile. Okay, okay. It is a reptile. So, close to the archosaur lineage then, because we've explained this in other episodes where the dinosaurs, the birds, crocodilians all split off from a common ancestor. That's right. And so this animal is a very close cousin of the dinosaurs, so it's on the bird side of that archosaur split. Crocs over here, birds over here. Okay. It's on the bird line just like all the other dinosaurs are, but this thing just technically isn't a dinosaur, but it's as close as you can be. Okay. And it lived alongside some of the first dinosaurs. So what makes a dinosaur a dinosaur then if this is not a dinosaur? And that's a great question. So just like any group of animals, mammals or primates or archosaurs like you said, dinosaurs is a word that people use to describe a teeny little bit of the tree of life. And to fit into dinosaurs, you have to have a lot of teeny little details in your anatomy just right. Hmm. And so this animal has a lot in common with dinosaurs, but it's missing a hole in his hips. He's missing a little bit of bone on his ankles. He's missing a little bit of length on this thing here on his arm bone for muscles to attach. And just those teeny details mean we don't call it a dinosaur, but it evolves right when they do. It lives alongside them. It's so close, but it's not a dinosaur. And now when I look at the skull, 
you know, it looks similar to the skull of like an iguana or maybe a monitor lizard. Yeah. And you look at those teeth and you think, yep, that's not something you want to run into in a dark, rainy forest, is it? No, maybe not, but I've got to tell you something else. If you look at those teeth real closely, they've got teeny little serrations on them. They look like little leaves. We think this guy might be a plant eater or maybe just an omnivore. Really? Yep. Not a meat eater. And certainly not a big, ferocious killer. So that whole scenario of being attacked by the Procom Sognathus <laughs> may not exist with this creature. Maybe not, but the thing is, if you step out of your time machine and you're in the forest with these guys, you probably are gonna think it's a dinosaur and I'm not gonna fault you for it. It looks a lot like one. Procomp Sognathus, also known as the Compi, was a true dinosaur, and they were aggressive pack hunters despite only being the size of a chicken. Armed with speed, incredible jumping skills, and a mouthful of razor sharp teeth, they would work as a team to isolate and take down much larger prey. Very cool. Thank you, Brandon, so much for giving us this fascinating education oh, of about a creature that looks like a dinosaur, but is not actually a true dinosaur. Oh, so close though. Man, now what we're gonna do next is meet up with Bill, who's gonna take us forward in time to the Jurassic period. Where we're gonna take a look at some bones from some of the icons you recognize from the Jurassic franchise, and definitely creatures that we can consider true dinosaurs. The Triassic period spanned between 252 and 201 million years ago. And while it proudly gave rise to the dinosaurs, all of the true giants that we recognize from the films actually began to appear in the Jurassic period, which lasted from 201 to 145 million years ago. Bill, are you here? Coyote, hold on, I'm gonna open up an aisle. See right there. Oh, look at this. Hey, there he is. Whoa, hey, how are you? that's pretty cool, right? Hey, hey, nice to finally meet you in Good person. To meet you too. Thank you for having us today here to the underbelly, the archives of the Chicago Field Museum. This is what we call oversized storage where all the dinosaurs are kept. Yes, now I just worked with Brandon and we looked at a creature from the Triassic period. No, very early, yeah. But you're gonna lead us into the Jurassic and then the Cretaceous. Yeah, let's see some good stuff. Okay, sounds good, lead the right. way. All right. Bill oversees the care of each and every fossil in this vast archive. So when we told him that we wanted to see some Jurassic icons, he knew exactly where to start. All right, Coyote, you wanna help me get this big bone out of here? Yeah, wow, sauropod bones. And I can already see that it says Brachiosaurus. This is gonna be cool. So I'll take my end out first and then you follow. Okay. Wow. It's a dinosaur. All right, crazy. Look at that bone. Holy mackerel, that is big. And how cool is this, getting to see a bone from one of the most iconic dinosaurs from the Jurassic franchise. Certainly, as you guys know, it is the first dinosaur that Grant, Sattler, and Malcolm saw as they arrived at Jurassic Park, the Brachiosaurus. If you were to stand beside a Brachiosaurus and look up, the crest of its head would reach 40 feet into the air, making it the tallest dinosaur in Jurassic World. These gentle giants were considered social, curious, and fearless in the face of predators, as their massive size was a primary means of defense. Now, I heard you calling it Brachiosaurus. I've grown up knowing it as Brachiosaurus. You know, there's no right pronunciation. They're both fine. Okay. Brachiosaurus, Brachiosaurus. Yeah, it's from so. Brachium, Greek for arm. Okay. Uh, this, this name means arm lizard, and it's in reference to the fact that unlike almost all other sauropods that have shorter front limbs than mm -hmm. hind limbs, Brachiosaurus was the first one found that had long front limbs. Okay. Thus the name Brachiosaurus. Now what bone is it that we're looking at here? This is actually the right femur, the right, right femur. thigh bone. Okay. The, uh, the head would be here, fits into the hip socket, and then that would be part of the knee. Okay. And how much does this bone weigh? Because even moving it on this cart is yeah, a challenge. It's, it's about a half a ton. Okay. Wow. The bone is six and a half feet long and uh, about a half a ton. That's crazy. Let's do this. I'm going to lay down next to it just so you guys can get some scale as to how big it really is. Now, I'm about five foot 10, so that's bigger than I am, isn't it? Oh yeah. Well, in fact, we are recreating, the fellow who discovered Brachiosaurus did exactly this out in the field in 1900, and we have a picture of him next to it. <sighs> so cool. I have never laid hands on a fossil like this before. Nothing this big, and it's incredibly dense. Yes. 
Unbelievable. It's a bit flattened, but yes, very dense. Hey Bill, I've heard that actually this particular fossil has some historical significance. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, when you find a new organism of any kind, plant, animal, extinct, living, you get to make up the name for it, you publish a very detailed description of it, and you designate one official example, the physical definition of your new organism. That's called a holotype. Holotypes are the rock stars of the natural history collection. This bone, along with those behind us, are the holotype of Brachiosaurus. Very cool. Well, as we know, the Brachiosaurus was an herbivore, a veggiosaurus. And as we move forward into the Cretaceous period, think we can get some carnivore fossils up close for the cameras? Yeah, let's go see some. All right, guys, let's go take a look at some meat eaters. Brachiosaurus will forever stand tall as one of the Jurassic franchise's most beloved dinosaurs. Whether using its 30-foot neck to reach leaves in the treetops or displaying its massive 56 tons of power by simply walking through a scene, we never fail to admire this titan with childlike wonder. The Jurassic period was certainly rich with dinosaurs, yet some of the most recognizable stars were actually roaming the planet 145 to 66 million years ago during the Cretaceous period. And while land-dwelling dinosaurs have commanded a fair share of screen time, Jurassic fans now have a prehistoric predator that hunted beneath the waves. Revealing the Cretaceous period. All right, here we go. Sweet. So we've got a variety of different Cretaceous animals here, but if you want to see a carnivore, we've got one right here. Oh yes, guys, check this out. This That's is, Mosasaurus, right? Yeah, this is a Mosasaur, uh -huh, an, an aquatic lizard. So it's not at all a dinosaur. Not a dinosaur. It's okay. on the whole other side of the reptile tree. Okay, now is this something that I can hold on to? Let me get the skull out and okay. I can show you. Wow, that is impressive. Now, did you guys find this like this, completely articulated? No, this one was actually donated to the museum. You okay. can help me support it. I'll turn it right side up. Right. Hey, Put your hands under the snout, maybe a little closer in, yep. Okay, about there. Yeah. It's heavy. Most mosasaurs are fairly two-dimensional. They're flattened. This mm -hmm. one has been expanded out, so it's fairly three-dimensional. That is cool. You can now. see the sclerotic ring, the bones inside the eye. Yes. At over 70 feet in length, the park's mosasaur hails as the largest carnivore in Jurassic World and far surpasses anything that we have seen in the fossil record. And while it hunted the ocean during the same time period that T-Rex stalked the land, this giant marine reptile is more closely related to monitor lizards than it is to dinosaurs. Let's put the skull back and let's take a look at, do you call these the flippers? Yeah, flippers, paddles. Okay. Yeah, they're the hands and feet of this animal. That's cool. Look at that, guys. Wow. Just like an oar, and you can just imagine this thing propelling itself forward at incredible speeds. And I mean, do you think that they were, were rather quick? Yeah, of course they were. Yeah, carnivores, yeah, you bet. They'd be uh, terrifying. Yeah. Now, is there something that I can hold on to? Yeah. Okay. There's a beautiful little, uh, section of lower jaw in this specimen over here. Oh, is it this right here? Yeah, okay. go ahead and pick that up. That's pretty well preserved. Check this out, guys. A smaller jawbone. That's a little bit easier to hold on to than the full skull. Look at that. Quite the intimidating reptile. Now, in reptiles, you have lots of bones in the lower jaw. Mm -hmm. We as mammals, we're used to just having one bone, but in a reptile, you've got lots of different bones, and this is just one of them. Now, like crocodilians, were they constantly rejuvenating their teeth because I see there's more teeth coming yeah. out from the jaw socket yeah, there. Yeah, absolutely. This, I consider this a small one. I mean, in the movie, they're so much bigger. Yeah, there's a huge diversity in size uh, in this group because it's a big group. Uh, mm -hmm. There are small ones. This is a middle-sized one. Um, the one in the movie obviously was a real giant. Well, I think it goes without question. The Mosasaur certainly is one intimidating predator. And as we know, at the end of Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, we got a couple sneak peeks as to this creature existing now amongst the humans. And I know we're all really excited to see where the next film's gonna take us. Well, it certainly was an honor for myself and the crew to be here going behind the scenes at the Chicago Field Museum. Bill, thank you so much Great for leading you, us on this trip through time from the Triassic to the Jurassic and finally the Cretaceous period. I'm Coyote Peterson. Be brave. Stay wild. 
We'll see you on the next Jurassic World adventure. The science of paleontology has provided us all with a gateway into the past. And when combined with the art of filmmaking, it's easy to see why the results have captivated generations of dinosaur fanatics. In its own right, the Jurassic franchise is responsible for encouraging countless minds to follow their dreams into these respective fields. By embracing this very notion, the renowned Chicago Field Museum strives to inspire discovery and spark public engagement with art and science, helping to bring these dreams to reality. If you love the Jurassic franchise as much as we do, then make sure to go back and watch the films from Universal Home Entertainment that sparked an adventure 65 million years in the making. This collection is now available on Blu-ray, DVD, and digital download. Hey, dinosaur fans, make sure to subscribe and click the notification bell so you can join the Jurassic World Explorers next week as we go behind the scenes with Sue, the world's largest and most complete Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton.